from Hollywood, the Hollywood Radio Theater. Starring Tyrone Powell and Deborah Paget in I'll Never Forget You. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. I think you'll be as intrigued with our play tonight as I was when I discovered it was a most unusual love story. The story of a modern scientist in love with a girl whom he meets in another century. Starring in his original role in this extraordinary romance from the 20th Century Fox Studios is Tyrone Power, one of your favorite stars, recreating his original role and playing opposite him in I'll Never Forget You is that lovely new star, Deborah Patchett. Now the curtain rises on I'll Never Forget You, starring Tyrone Power as Peter Standish and Deborah Patchett as Helen Pettigrew. <laughs> London, England. The office of a director of an atomic research laboratory. Well, the experiment seems to prove my point, Sir Alfred. Some sort of autocatalytic damping has to be developed, or fission will begin instantly. Thank you. Meanwhile, Dr. Standish, you're not to engage in any further experiments. But I thought that what I did this I morning I am not was... questioning your ability as a physicist, but we don't work here on the basis of trial and error. One error could be disastrous. That's all, Dr. Standish. Yes, sir. I'll give you my written report within the hour. Well, Forsyth? I'm afraid you're right, sir. He needs a rest. Have a talk with him, will you? You seem to know him better than any of us. Try to persuade him to go away for a few weeks. Well, it's strange, but when I say I know him, I'm not sure I really do. He's an American, no family, graduated from MIT with honors, specialized in nuclear physics at Los Alamos. Outside of that, Well, I... uh, see what you can get out of him, will you? Convince him he's got to take a rest. I'll do my best, Sir Alfred. Thanks for sight. Well, it looks like quite a storm, doesn't it? I'm much obliged for the ride. Oh, pleasure. Um, aren't you going to ask me in for a drink? Oh, sorry. Sorry, come in, of course. Well, this is very elegant, Standish. I didn't know you were so rich. No, I'm not. A distant relative, a man named Pettigrew, left the house to me. Years ago, it belonged to an ancestor of mine, also an American. Aside from electricity and plumbing, it's just about as it was 200 years ago. I'll turn on a light. It's very beautiful. But living here all alone, well, I... It's wonderful. Really? It'd give me the willies. Sit down. I'll get us a drink. Uh, that portrait over the mantel, Standish. It's amazing. Why, you might have sat for that portrait yourself. I did sit for it. I mean, that's my ancestor. His name was Peter Standish, too. Soda? Please. You know, Peter, it's surprising how little I know about you. You keep to yourself a great deal, never accept an invitation to go out. You know, my sister's still annoyed with you. Martha's very anxious to meet you. I, um, I have asked her to stop by. Tonight? Well, yes, I, I thought the three of us You might shouldn't have done that, Roger. Well, look, I, I don't mean to be rude. It's just that I'm all tied up. I, I've been doing quite a bit of research lately, not only at the laboratory, but here at the house. It's a sort of hobby. You ask me, you've been overdoing it all around. What about going away for a while? I am going away. Oh? Well, good, fine. Where? This may startle you... But I'm going back. Back to the 18th century. Really? Now, how do you propose to do that? I'm serious. I believe the 18th century still exists. It's all around us, if only we could find it. Uh, now, wait. Wait before you say I'm completely insane. Way out there in space is a star. Polaris, the North Star. It's very bright. Yet it takes almost 50 years before the light of that star reaches us. For all we know, Polaris may have ceased to exist somewhere around... 1900, yet we still see it. Its past is our present. Yes, I think I'll have another drink. Henry James expressed it like this. You're on a winding stream in a boat. You watch the banks as they pass by. Upstream, you went by a grove of maple trees, but you can't see them anymore because they're in the past. Right now, you're going by a field of clover. That becomes the present. Now, you don't know what's ahead of you around that bend in the stream. May be wonderful things, but you won't be able to see them until you get around the bend, into the future. But suppose I'm above you in an airplane. I'm looking down at it all. I see the maple trees, the clover field, and around the bend. 
your past, your present, and your future. They're all one to the man in the plane. Well, yes, yes, of course they are, but... And so it is with the years and centuries we call time. It's all one, Roger. Real time is all one. And that man in the portrait is still alive. That man in the portrait with his silk coat and his ruffles and his powdered wig, that man is dead. I tell you he's alive. Not here, not now. But he does exist. Back there in his own time. And that man and I are going to change places for a while. He'll take my place. I'll take his. In the year 1784. I'm going back to that wonderful age. Forget it, Peter. Give it up. You're beginning to believe me. No, but I'm beginning to believe that you believe it. Peter, this house isn't any good for you. You've got to get out of it. Now, I'm at home here. All I love is in this house. This is London in the 18th century. The age of reason, of dignity and grace. Well, there goes the electricity. No lights. It's all right. There's a candle here. Come over here to the desk, Roger. There's something I'd like you to see. This paper. Read it. June 12, 1784. For many weeks, Peter Standish Esquire has been possessed of strange fancies. On this day, in a fit of madness... Go on. On this day, in a fit of madness, Peter Standish declared he was from the future and could foretell history. At the instance of his friends and relatives, he was removed to a madhouse. Signed, Sir William Sutherland. That paper was with the diary of Peter Standish. I found it up in the attic. It's what started me thinking about all this. You see, Roger, Peter Standish never went to that madhouse. A few days later, he was declared normal again. He married Kate Pettigrew. They had two children, and he died peacefully in this house at the age of 63. The man who said he was from the future and could foretell history, the man who was committed to a lunatic asylum, was another Peter Standish. Me. Look, Peter, drop it. It's all here in this house. My passport to the past. Manners, customs, history, even to the costumes they wore. Peter Standish arrived from America on the 23rd of April, the same day as this, 1784. The trip took 23 days in a ship called the General Wolf. It's all here, here in his diary. He arrived just before Kate's birthday. I even know about the Cashmere Shawl Kate's aunt sent her from Wales. There was a storm that day, Roger. Like this storm. His coach was struck by lightning just as he arrived in front of the house. But he wasn't hurt. In his diary, he says... I'm leaving, Peter, and you're coming with me. We'll have dinner and then... No, no. No, thanks. Then I'll spend the night. Uh, Here, I mean. To look after me? (laughs) Thanks, Roger. But you run along. Look, suppose you do go. How does it happen? How do you get back? Do you get back? I don't know. Peter, don't go back into that house. Goodbye, Roger. Mr. Standish, are you here, sir? No. No, I'm, I'm all right. What happened? Just as we left the coach, sir, a bolt of lightning struck. Lucky we weren't all blasted into the next world. Yes, aren't we? Well, this is it, sir. Pettigrew House in Barclay Square. Thank you. Good night, sir. Pettigrew House in Barclay Square. 1784. Well, Roger, wherever you are, now do you believe me? I've come back to Barclay Square. Oh, I knew I heard someone. Do come in, cousin. Cousin? I... I am Kate Pettigrew, sir. I bid you welcome on my mother's behalf. Kate? Of course. How do you do? (laughs) How do I do what? Oh, forgive me. I I meant to say that I... that I'm honored to know you. Uh, Your mother, the Lady Anne Pettigrew, she's well, I trust? Oh, indeed, sir. But she wanted me to meet you first so that I might make an impression. Have I made an impression? You've no idea. Do sit down, sir, and tell me about your voyage. You said nothing about it in your letter. Well, the the General Wolfe is no Queen Mary, but... Queen Mary? Oh, it's a, a figure of speech from across the ocean. But you mentioned my letter. What letter? The one to my mother. Oh, my letter from the shipping office. Honored madam, I shall do myself the honor of waiting on you this afternoon at half past five o'clock. 
Have you likewise committed to memory your letters to me? Oh, every one. And all your letters to me. I know all about us. We're to be married. Indeed, I had not heard of it. But it's all been arranged. Hasn't it? Arranged, sir? You've not even asked Mama's consent to court me. Well, must I? But is it not the custom in America? Uh, not in New York. These are strange manners you bring us from the New World. Well, Kate... If you prefer the more formal declaration, I know just how it was done. Uh, is done. Fair cousin, Miss Pettigrew, you cannot be insensible to the devotion oh, I... dear, dear cousin. Oh, 10,000 welcome. Lady Anne. No, sir, that is all you have to say. Oh, forgive me, ma'am. Kate, Kate's beauty has quite deprived me of my wits. Dear, dear cousin. Allow me, sir, may I present our friend, Mr. Thrussell? Your servant, sir. How do you... Uh, your servant, sir. And this is my son, Thomas. Think me, ma'am. Look at him. A veritable fashion plate. I anticipated Buckskin's cousin, or whatever the fashion is in... Uh, uh, what do you call the colonies now? The United States of America. Ah, a trifle pompous, what? But after all, you Americans will soon come back to the fold. Oh, I wish I had your knowledge of foreign affairs. Uh, meanwhile, sir, your coats are better fit than mine, and your boots are perfection. Perfect. Section, sir. Tom, be a dear boy and send the coachman to his for his boxes. And Kate, see if the Admiral's room is made ready. Yes, Mama, at once. I am giving you my husband's room, cousin. Poor man, he died there, you know. How kind of you, my lady. I shall show you all of London, sir. Now, where shall we visit first? Vauxhall Gardens? Ranelagh? I want to see everything. I want to walk the streets and hear the sounds and breathe the air of London. I want to go to the theatre and talk to Dr. Johnson... I want Sir Joshua Reynolds to paint my portrait, and I... You are a man of enthusiasms, Mr. Standish. <laughs> Forgive me, Mr. Thrasso, but there's so much to do in London. I mean, for an American, it, it's, it's quite an experience. Excuse me, Mama. Cousin, this is my sister, Helen. Your servant, sir. Helen? Your sister? In my letters, I have often mentioned Helen. Not that I remembered, ma'am. And I surely would have remembered. Perhaps some of Mama's letters went astray. Miss Helen, how charming you look, ma'am. Accustom yourself to Thrussell's endearments, cousin. Tom, please. And regard him as one of the family. Thomas. I may go so far as to say prospective brother-in-law, eh, Thrussell? I had not asked as yet, nor has Helen encouraged me to ask. Really, Tom? Uh, do you dance, cousin Peter? Uh, not very well, I'm afraid. Oh, you're modest, sir. There's to be a ball here next month. Oh, hundreds of guests, dear cousin. I shall be distracted with preparation. The occasion will be Kate's birthday, sir. Oh, of course. I remember now. And the gift from your aunt in Wales. Gift? What gift? Why, the cashmere shawl. Shawl? From Aunt Caroline? Uh, a link boy did bring something from Aunt only this morning, Kate. It's in the hall. I'll bring it in. Oh, you sly puss. You never told me. But how could you know about it, cousin? Yes. Explain, sir. Is this some sort of a uh, conjurer's trick? Trick? I don't know. Be believe me, I... I must have got muddled somehow. Tis not you who are muddled, sir. Look. Is that not a shawl in Helen's hand? Helen? Oh, bring it here. Oh, how lovely. But how did you know? Well, I, I, I must have... I'm, I'm afraid I have a terrible headache. But perhaps our cousin saw the shawl as he came in. I couldn't resist peeping, Kate. I, I had opened the box in the hall. Yes, and then when I heard mention of your birthday, I took it for granted it was a gift. Oh, that explains it, of course. Oh, but your headache, cousin, you must rest after so long a journey. So very long a journey, ma'am. Pray to follow me, sir. Kate and I shall show you up the stairs. Odd sort of card, eh, Thrussell? Atrocious kind of English, even for an American. I am still wondering about Miss Catherine Shaw. He explained that. Did he, my dear? And tell us how he knew it came from your aunt. Come in. Some tea, cousin, and a compress for your head. My what? Oh, oh, yes, yes. That's very kind of you, Helen. Oh, no, no, don't go, please. Stay and talk with me for a moment. And what would you like to talk about? Well, most of all, you. I can't understand why just the letters in which you were mentioned are missing. It is odd. You were quite a shock to me. I, I wasn't prepared for you. Are you prepared for everyone else you meet for the first time? Oh, no, no, of course not, but... I found myself wanting to talk to you, to ask you to help me here. Help you, cousin? I've been looking out of the window at London. London, 1784. 
the buildings, the coaches, the people on the streets. It's, it's all so strange. Stranger than I thought it would be. It makes me uncomfortable. You sense that. I can see that you sense it. Kate will soon put you at your ease. Kate. I like Kate. It would be most disastrous if you did not. Well, I do. I, I love her. Helen, are you really engaged to that Mr. Throssell? Tom had no right to say what he did. You're not in love with him? No one pretends that I am. Then why does We're he... We're very poor, cousin. When our father died, he left us nothing but debts. Your marriage to Kate would be convenient for us. But should Kate mislike you, she will not have you. No more than I will have, Mr. Throssell. That's the spirit, cousin. Look, we'll make a bargain. I'm to be a part of the family. Now, I'll help you get along here, and you, you help me. But I'd forgotten. I, I still know nothing about you. Perhaps you do marry Throssell after all. I, I don't understand. You seem frightened. You, you must never be afraid of me, Helen. I'm not afraid, cousin. Just curious. You speak so oddly at times. And the shore. But I explained No, that. I explained it. And it wasn't true. I had not left Kate's gift in the hall, and you knew it was a shawl. Even I didn't know that. I had not opened it. Your servant, cousin. You'll hear Act Two of I'll Never Forget You in a few moments. Make a friend, and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. Not too long ago, a request was received by the United States State Department for help in setting up a modern medical system in Thailand. The man selected for the job was Dr. Ben Eisman of St. Louis, whose work went far beyond the limits of his three-month job. In Thailand, he discovered that 17 million people living in the interior were being treated by only 700 doctors who were sadly ignorant of modern surgical techniques. At every turn, he fought against strong native superstitions to accomplish his work. With his small supply of instruments, he removed a ruptured appendix from a young Thai girl and performed a successful operation on the hair lip of another. He did plastic surgery and worked with skin grafts, putting in from 15 to 20 hours a day. In the evenings, he completed two medical textbooks, which were translated into the Thai language and were given free to any doctors or technicians who asked for them. Through Dr. Eisman's efforts and with American medical aid, a program was set up to raise the standards of health and medical education in Thailand and nearby countries. Thanks to Dr. Eisman, America has won herself more grateful allies. In recognition of his works, U.S. Envoy Edwin Stanton wrote these words to Dr. Eisman. You are one of the greatest ambassadors of goodwill America has ever sent abroad. Thus, Dr. Eisman had the personal satisfaction of knowing that by helping others, you help your country. Now, our producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Act two of I'll Never Forget You, starring Tyrone Power as Peter and Deborah Paget as Helen. Year is 1784, and in the house on Barclay Square, Lady Anne, her son Tom, and Mr. Throssell discuss with marked uneasiness their strange guest from America, Peter Stanley. I tell you, ma'am, it's been going on for a month. He wanted me to show him London, did he not? Every night since he came here. And for shame, the places you have chosen to take him to. When I lose a dice, he knows to the shilling how much I'm going to ask him to lend me. At the boxing arena, he names the winners and the rounds they shall win in. The fellow never makes a mistake. And when you ask him how he knows... He apologizes, Thrussell. He apologizes. There must be some explanation. There is, lady. Kate said there was a clap of thunder just before he entered this house five weeks ago. It is said that the devil... Mr. Throssell, I must ask you to remember that Mr. Standish is our cousin. Forgive me, ma'am. Could you not request him to join us now? With your permission, there are questions I should like to ask of Mr. Standish. I fear that's impossible, sir. Sir Joshua Reynolds is painting his portrait. Ah, then uh, Miss Helen is unoccupied. I must crush your hopes, Throssell. Helen has gone with him. Helen and Kate. <laughs> Mr. Standish, if you will resume the pose, I shall proceed with the portrait. You're sure we're not disturbing you, Sir Joshua? I am but flattered that two such lovely creatures should wish to attend me. There, you see? Cousin, please, you mustn't talk. Oh, I insist that you do talk, Mr. Standish. 
fear, sir, that all of London is discussing you. They say that you foretold Mendoza's victory over the pugilist Jackley. Can you foretell the future, sir? Oh, no. No, I made a few cockeyed guesses, that's all. Well, cockeyed? Oh, it's, it's an American word, Kate. We're developing a new language over there. So I have heard. You must instruct me in it. Your eyes, Mr. Standish. They baffle me. My eyes? You must excuse me. I, I am unable to paint anymore but, but today. But, Sir Joshua, the sitting has just begun. Something in the face eludes me. His eyes, his head. I cannot capture their expression. Now, what possible expression in any face could elude the artist who has painted Mrs. Siddons? The greatest of actresses, the mistress of all expressions. Sir, you make sport of me. No, I assure you, Sir Joshua. You I have mi- visited Mrs. Siddons at the theater. She has broken her word to me. I have never met her. I only say what is common knowledge. Surely that portrait of her is finished. You have painted the tragic muse. One sitting, Mr. Standish. Preliminary sketches and nothing more. And the knowledge of it was confined to Mrs. Siddons and myself. Oh, but, but, but surely it must Even have been Even Mrs. Siddons did not know that my title for her portrait is to be the tragic muse. It was known only to me. Uh, Miss Pettigrew, I no longer wish to paint the portrait of your cousin. You may leave in your own time. Good day to you, sir. Go after him, Peter. Reason with him. You seem to have expected this. You knew it would happen. No, but since it has, I'm not surprised. Painters have good eyes. I wonder what Sir Joshua saw in yours. It made him afraid of you, as as I am afraid of you. I shall wait in the carriage, Helen. But, but Peter, he mustn't refuse to finish your portrait. He'll finish it. Now go to your sister. <laughs> Self, Mom. Out there on the terrace, my sister and Peter Standish. A pretty sight, is it not? This is unlike you, Kate. Our cousin but pays his respects. You think me jealous. No, it is not that, Mom. But when I am with him, he makes me afraid. When Helen is with him, I am afraid for her. This is absurd. Surely you have not given him to suspect your feelings? He no longer suspects. He knows, because I have told him. Kate, oh, how could you? And such a moment to tell me this when tonight... Oh, how could you forget the ball? I have not forgotten, Mum. The Duchess of Devonshire is coming. Half of London will be here. You need not fret over me, Mama. If you must worry, place your concern where mine lies. Upon our cousin, Peter Standish. About you, Helen. Are you like Kate? Are you afraid of me now, too? I couldn't be afraid of someone I feel sorry for. Sorry? You're unhappy with this. London is not what you expected, is it? No. Today I walked the streets of London. I saw children working at benches in a cellar. I, I saw a little boy trying to weave a basket and a woman beating him with a whip. I saw a cart filled with screaming men and women being driven off to a madhouse while the people hooted at them, pelted them with mud and filth. No, Helen. London in 1784 is not what I expected. If it weren't for you, it would be unbearable. No, you mustn't say things like that to me. I am Kate's sister. And I shall be Kate's husband. But I think that you alone know who I am and what I am and that you understand. I know that there is some mystery about you. I know that you're not evil as some say you are. But that is all I know. Do you trust me? Yes. You must have wondered, as all the others have, how I've been spending my afternoons these past three weeks. Come with me now and let me show you. If you wish. It won't take long. You'll be back in ample time to deck yourself out for the Duchess of Devonshire. Get your cloak, Helen. I'll find a carriage and meet you at the back gate. Apothecary shop? Well, I, uh, I've required certain chemicals and instruments. I found them here in Mr. Jacobs' apothecary shop, as well as a room that he offered for rent. Now come and I'll show you. There, you see? It's a laboratory, Helen. Are you an alchemist? If you mean, can I transform lead into gold? No. Although I could do even that if I had a cyclotron. Now, here is something that may interest you. A lantern? Well, like a lantern, perhaps. 
It's an electric light. And these are what we call batteries. Leiden jars would be more accurate. It's amazingly crude, but it works. Now watch. Why, it burns. The light burns. <laughs> yes. yes, it does, after a fashion. Without oil or without a wick. Now, here's something else. Remember, remember last week you were wondering what I was doing with that strange-looking little box? Yes. I was taking a picture of Mr. Throssell. Here, look. Why, it's truer than any portrait. We call this a photograph. And the box is a camera. A schoolboy could make one. Uh, and this, here on the table, a boat? A model of a boat. A boat without sails. It runs by steam. You have invented all these things? No. Other men invented them. Or rather, they will invent them. But where I come from, these things are known and used by everyone. Where do you come from, Peter? I come from the future, Helen. I'm here because of... Well, because of some warp, some accident of time and nature. It's never happened before. It may never happen again. But I am here. Then you do see ahead. You do know what will happen in the years to come. You believe me, then? Yes, I believe you. I'm here taking another man's place. Your cousin from America. And he? Where is he? Perhaps he's in my place. In my world, I don't know. Is that why you have made these things? To remind you of your other life? No. But when I saw your century as it really is, the disease and the filth and the cruelty, I, I wanted to do something about it. There are men in England now who are working on all these things. But suppose that right now I could show them how scientists, years after them, will develop their discoveries. They'll be afraid. They'll say you're mad. No. When they see these things, they'll understand them. They won't be afraid any more than you are, cousin. We're really not cousins. I've lost you, Peter. We're strangers now, and, and to you I must seem... To me, you seem the only real beauty in all this ugly century. No, no, please take me home, Peter. Take me home at once. Look, you, Russell. Look how they crowd about Standish. Why, it's a levee began. At least for the moment he is not with Miss Helen. He's not to be born, sir. Helen has danced with no one else but Standish all evening. Your lover's impatience moves me. Not once has he danced with Kate. Not once. The old devil take her. He's asked her a dozen times and she's refused it. With good cause. Oh. You too, eh? Afraid of Standish? You play a different tune. Were he a little less liberal in the lending of money. I tell you, there's a spell of brimstone about him. I have a secret to tell you, Throssel. Well? Every morning, two serving maids must carry buckets of hot water to his rooms. He washes himself. Washes himself? All over? Every morning, Begar, the man will scrub his skin away. Perhaps Americans find bathing more necessary than others. Ah, he's seen us. A glass of punch, cousin. Thank you. You're curious about my bathing habits, Mr. Throssell. Frankly, sir, I am. Well, cleanliness hasn't always been an eccentricity, Mr. Throssell. You admire the Romans. They, too, bathed every day. Ah, yes. But only when they became degenerate, sir. The virile fathers of the Republic. We're as dirty as you, I've no doubt. Uh, Mr. Standish, sir. Oh, Mr. James Boswell, I believe. Uh, your servant, sir. I, uh, I come as the honored messenger of the Duchess of Devonshire and Dr. Johnson. I am to fetch you to the terrace, sir. They mean to try your wit, cousin. Care to come along, Tom? Uh, no, no, I thank you. No, I have no desire to provide a target for Dr. Johnson's epigram. Perhaps I may have one or two he hasn't heard yet. <laughs> Johnson. So this is your fabulous Mr. Standish. I am truly honored, Your Grace. We've been looking forward to a conversation with you, sir. A noble prospect for an American, ma'am. The most noble prospect an American sees is the ship that will carry him to England. Ah. Do not begrudge us our poor stretches of wilderness, Dr. Johnson. You upon whose empire the sun never sets. Sir... That is the most fitting compliment ever paid to Great Britain. Oh, capital, Mr. Standish, capital. Ah, I wish I had said that. You will, Boswell. You will. I am told, sir, that you regard this country as a museum, and ourselves as specimens in a glass cage. Oh, I'm, but I must not leave you with that impression, Your Grace. Well, do your best to make another, then, ere we go to our beds. I cannot bring myself to delay you, ma'am. Early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. And a woman, Mr. Standish? A woman, ma'am. An ordinary woman, that is. 
should be struck regularly like a Chinese gong. Oh. <laughs> well, tell me, sir, is it true what Mr. Boswell would have me believe, that I'm known even in America? Oh, what barbarian has never heard of the Fifth Duchess, ma'am? Your name in English history is the finest flower of the age of elegance. We know of your beauty. Gainsborough has painted you, hasn't he? He has. Thank you. Yes, all one's dreams of the time have you as their central figure. Powerful in politics, irresistible in love. Who can compare Sir, the... Sir, I, I find your overwhelming compliments a little disturbing. You speak about me as if, as if you were reading my obituary. In the past tense. Oh, Your Grace, surely I, I never once used the past tense. But you've been thinking of me in the past tense. But, as if I were already dead. M Mr. Boswell, if you'll call my carriage. I did so want to make an impression. You have made an indescribable impression. Good night. <laughs> Tomorrow we'll find us the laughing stock of society. The Duchess has taken the fence. Our guests are leaving. And Kate, Kate has danced with every man here except Peter Standish. But, Mama, I'm sure that Kate is And just... you, Miss Hoity Toity, barely civil to our dear Mr. Throttle. Ma'am, I'm grateful for even my few crumbs of attention. Oh, dear Mr. Throttle, I'm distracted beyond endurance. And what about me? All London is feeling sorry for me. Engaged to that... That madman. Oh, vapors, vapors. You will marry him, Kate, if I have, have to... to what? Hey, Kate, you have no reason to be afraid of him. No more reason than to fear a graveyard at midnight. Shame, shame to talk thus of your lover. His purse is filled, isn't it? So nothing else about him matters to anyone else but me. But can't you see that he's unhappy too? Kate, uh, oh, forgive me. Oh, dear, dear, Peter. I'd like to be alone with Kate. Of course. Helen, Tom, Mr. Throttle, back to our guests now and quickly. Ah, as if many still remain. Kate, you've been deliberately avoiding me all evening. You've not been avoiding my sister, sir. Throttle's upset you. I know what he's been saying. Yes, I'm sure you know. You know what he said and you know what I'm thinking. You know things no mortal man should know. Forget tonight, please. You'll be yourself in the morning. I am myself. And I tell you our understanding is ended. Kate, you mustn't break our engagement. You can't. It, it didn't happen that way. How smugly you say it. You think there's no limit to your power over women. They all press after you, don't they? But no woman will dance with you twice or stay with you alone in a room. Except Helen. I have never been so afraid of anything in my life as I am of you. We are going to be married, Kate. I was afraid to look into your eyes. But now, look into mine... Look into mine and tell me that you love me. You can't, can you? Kate, where are you going? I am leaving this house. Nor will I ever return as long as you remain. We'll continue with this week's production of the Hollywood Radio Theater in just a moment. We pause now for station identification. The curtain rises on Act Three of I'll Never Forget You, starring Tyrone Power as Peter and Deborah Paget as Helen. long past midnight. The ball is over and the house on Barclay Square is dark and quiet. Peter Stanish has wandered from out to the garden only to find that Helen is waiting for him. You're worried, aren't you, Peter? You're worried about Kate. She's broken off with me. Yes, I know. She's left for our house in the country. Peter, I want you to tell me about the future. No. You wouldn't like it, Helen. I want to know for Kate's sake. Th then I can go to her and make her understand. There aren't words to make either of you understand. You don't really have to tell me, Peter. I can see the future. I can see things in your eyes. Oh, what you see is only what you imagine. Look at me, Peter. Look at me. Your eyes. I see our house. The drawing room. 
blazing with your magic lights. There's a picture on the wall. A portrait. Your portrait finished just as you said it would be. Now I can see sunshine through the windows and white clouds. And in the sky is, is a huge machine flying through the air. And airplanes. Men travel in them. Below it is water. The ocean. A great ship without sails, without masts. And there, a cluster of towers reaching into the clouds. A city across the sea. Oh, it's beautiful, Peter. The future's like a beautiful dream of heaven. Yes, it's strange and beautiful, Helen. And terrible, too. Do you think you can tell Kate what you've seen without her being afraid? Well, I can't tell her either. But you've told me. Only because something has happened that, that wasn't meant to happen. I've fallen in love with you. And Kate? When I kissed Kate, I was playing a part. That was another man's kiss to his betrothed. But this is a man who's not yet born. There's never been a kiss like this since the world began. What becomes of us, Peter? What is my future? I don't know. All the others, yes. I know everything about them until the day they die. But not you. It's, it's as though you... You never existed. But I do exist, and only for you. Now, in the future and all. Oh, no, my darling, no. This... This isn't my world. It isn't my life. And someday soon I... I shall have to leave. No, stay here, Peter. Never leave me. Never leave me. Mr. Thrustle, oh dear, Mr. Thrustle, do, do come in. Your servant, my lady, and good morning. Uh, look, Tom, it's Mr. Thrustle. Hi, my dear fellow. Why, we haven't seen you for a week. As for Helen, you've broken her heart, sir. That's enough, Tom. I have been with Miss Helen in thought. I've been far from London, my lady. Uh, then we may hope that your visits here will not be altogether discontinued, even if... Even uh... if Miss Helen prefers another suitor to myself. Things do turn out in a devilish queer fashion, don't they, Thrustle? Certainly there is nothing queer in preferring your cousin's 10,000 a year to my 1,500. Lady Anne, I've been travelling all night with your daughter Kate. Kate? She is on her way home by coach. Convince Miss Helen to give up Peter Standish. Give up 10,000 pounds? Why, oh, she's mad with jealousy. Kate belongs in Bedlam Asylum. She's lost her mind. It's rather more likely that Peter Standish will be committed to an asylum. One hour ago, the Bow Street magistrate examined his affairs in Shepherd's Market. Shepherd's Market? What affairs? Affairs, madam, that but a few years ago would have had your Mr. Standish burned at the stake. A laboratory man filled with instruments of the devil. Powers and distillations and fire... Where is he? Where is my cousin now? In the custody of the law. The magistrate will bring him here as soon as Kate has returned. Here? Oh, the disgrace. But why? Why? As witnesses, my lady. When Peter Standish faces his accusers... Who? Who accuses him? Kate Pettigrew. And your servant, sir. <laughs> Oh, dear cousin, what dreadful mistake has overtaken you? I'm afraid you'll have some difficulty, my lady, convincing these gentlemen that there is a mistake. Oh, allow me, ma'am. Mr. Appleton, the magistrate, and Sir William Sutherland of the Royal College of Physicians. Gentlemen. Lady Anne, is your service, ma'am. Your daughter, Miss Catherine, has arrived, my lady. I have. Oh, welcome home, Kate. Ah, and Mr. Thrussell. You wear your triumph well, Mr. Thrussell. That you shall triumph, sir, not I. If you have charged Mr. Standish, gentlemen, I demand to know for what. They tell me I am a lunatic, my lady. Let me add that my arrest was not entirely unexpected. Uh, Ma'am, your daughter, Catherine, and Mr. Thrassel here have petitioned that Peter Standish be confined to a lunatic asylum for the remainder of his natural life. Mm. Uh, Miss Pettigrew, I must ask you formally to identify the prisoner. Is he the man? He is. Uh, thank you. Uh, that is all, Sir William. I have a request, Mr. Appleton. Uh, well? A word with Sir William, alone. Oh, well, that is up to Sir William. Yeah, very well. I suggest that the rest of you wait in the hall. I shall not keep you long. You're a doctor, Sir William, a man of science. Do you think I'm mad? My personal opinion is of no concern. I serve the Royal College and the Crown. I obey their laws. Those things you found in my laboratory? Your laboratory and all it contained has been destroyed. You found a light there, didn't you? A lamp. It was created by electricity. 
Very crude, I grant you, but from that beginning will come more and more powerful lights until they're able to penetrate through skin and bone. Give a picture of a man's anatomy or his brain. An X-ray picture that you can study before starting an operation. I must warn you, sir, that anything you say... There is also a drug called chloroform. It renders a person unconscious in perfect safety so that a surgeon can operate without causing pain. You suggest you could show me how to work these miracles? But they're not miracles. Sir William, forgive me, but those marks on your face, pock marks from smallpox... Mm, They're common enough. A hundred and fifty years from now, everyone born in England will be saved that disfigurement by a simple scratch with a needle. A vaccination. Sir William... We can gain that 150 years. If you will... You are wasting my time, Mr. Standish. It is my carefully considered opinion that you have lost all reason. Mr. Appleton. I'm afraid the magistrate will have to wait a moment longer. There's someone else I have to speak to. Lady Anne, where is Helen? In her chambers, cousin. Go to no. her if you... No, he must not see her. Mr. Standish, we ask you to please leave this house. Kate. Oh, you wicked child. Oh, dear cousin, I apologize. I apologize for everything Kate has said and done. Oh, the humiliation. Kate has done what she believed best for her sister. I do it again to prevent you from marrying Helen. I'm glad there is now no danger of such a disastrous occurrence. You seem so sure of yourself, Mr. Throssell. You will be transported to Bedlam, and I'm proud to state that I am responsible for your removal. I have had you followed, sir. It was I who discovered your den in Shepherd's Market. It was Get I... Get away from the stairs. Miss Helen no longer concerns you. I have forgiven her. I shall offer her honorable marriage. You've forgiven her? Why, you pipsqueak. You're not even fit to look at her. Cousin, I beg of you. I do not fear you, be you from heaven or hell. Retrima satanus. Why, you evil-minded, In nomine Immaculati. I renounce you. Get I out of my Satan way. In the name of the ambassador. Get out of my way. Forgive us all. Perhaps I'm the one who needs forgiveness for coming here. They say I'm mad. They baited you. They forced it on you. It doesn't matter anymore. Nothing in this world matters except you. Helen, I'm going to stay here with you. No, you have to go back to your own world, Peter. You must leave. I've known all along you must go back. But I couldn't face my own life without you. Oh, my darling, but we will be together. Always and always. I I want to show you something, Peter. Long ago, my father brought this to me from Egypt. It's a crooks on Sada. Crooks on Sada. The symbol of life and eternity. Just a little wooden cross, but I've always loved it. In some strange way, I knew my life and this cross were bound together. I'll leave it here for you, Peter, here in a secret corner of this desk. Perhaps no one will find it until you come. Maybe it will bridge the time between us. Mine while I live, and yours in a world I shall never see. Oh, Peter, I shall miss you so. It's almost here. The moment to go back. But I'll stay with you. I'll not go. But you must go, and all my love and joy will go with you. Oh, Peter, don't be too sad in the future about a girl who's been dead for so long. Mr. Standish, open this door. I want you to come to St. Mark's Churchyard. To you, that will be tomorrow. And yet it will be generations after I'm dead. I'll ask for a stone with the letters cut deep so they won't wear away before you come. Open the door! I love you always, Peter. Now in my time, in yours, and in whatever time we come. Helen, Helen... Go back to your world, Peter. Go back. Go back. Go back. Go back. Peter, Peter, are you all right? Huh? Oh. Well, hello, Roger. What are you doing here? Well, that's gratitude. That bolt of lightning before, uh, just as I was leaving, you were struck. You've been unconscious. I'm all right now, thanks. I, I'm sure I'm all right now. You were knocked out for quite some minutes, you know. I carried you up here to this bedroom. I would have called a doctor, but you don't have a phone, do you? No. No, I don't. Minutes, you said? Ten minutes, at least. Is that all? All? Foolish question. But we can't really measure time, can we? You were muttering to yourself, Peter, all sorts of weird things. Oh? Insisting that you'd just arrived from America on a sailing ship. You said that you were here to marry a girl named Kate 
Petticoat. And then you said you wouldn't leave until you talked to Helen. Well, Peter, who's Helen? Helen is a girl at this room. Her desk. Her desk. She put it here. Here in her desk. What the devil are you talking about? It's here. The crooks and Santa. Just where she left it. What is that thing? It's just something that... It's very old. I'm going out, Roger. I'm not sure when I'll be back. There's something else I have to try to find. You're going out in this rain? The front door. Well, don't look so startled. I told you before that my sister... You'd better let her in, hadn't you? And it may be simpler if I just slipped out the back way. Apologize for me, will you, Roger? No, I'm not so sure that I will not... Helen. Uh, this is Peter Standish, mother. Uh, Peter, my sister. Well, what are you staring at? I, is anything wrong, Mr. Standish? I'm sorry, but you remind me of... You look so much like someone I... I once knew. Well, I do know you. That, that is, in a way. Roger's told me so much about you. If you could wait here with Roger, I'll try not to be very long. St. Mark's Churchyard. St. Mark's. shall ask for a stone with the letters cut deep, so they won't wear away before you come to me. Here lies in the confident hope of the blessed resurrection and life eternal, Helen Pettigrew, beloved daughter of Sir John and Lady Anne Pettigrew, who departed this life September the 12th, 7th, 1784, aged 22 years. Only a little while after, and then she died. Peter, it's Martha. I followed you. Why did she die so young? I think heartbreak. We shall be together always. Not in my time, Peter, or in yours, but in God's time. In a minute, our stars will return. You probably remember when the waves of the North Sea burst through Holland's dikes and turned the little country into a land of terror. It was Western Europe's worst flood disaster. More than 1,400 people were killed, and over 60,000 were made homeless. The property loss was greater than that suffered during World War II. But America answered the call from the Dutch people. Within just a few hours, United States Army helicopters were evacuating hundreds from the danger areas. Mercy planes filled with blankets, coats, shoes, and food brought quick relief in the emergency. Among the many who contributed was the 82nd Airborne Division. They remembered the courage and the help displayed by the Dutch people when they parachuted into Holland in 1944. This one unit collected nearly 20,000 pounds of clothing and over $12,000 in cash for relief in the flooded country. Now, there was no official drive behind this operation. It emerged right from the heart, a spontaneous, genuine reaction to a country struck by disaster. It proved once more that in the hour of need, people will reach across borders and oceans to help their fellow men. Such acts by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. Now, here's Mr. Cummings with our stars. And here they are to take a curtain call for an evening we'll never forget. Rome Power and Deborah Patch. <laughs> Deborah, I understand you were once a starlet on the Lux Radio Theatre. Yes, Mr. Cummings. I appeared on the show twice while I was still studying at the studio school. And now Deborah is the pride and joy of 20th Century Fox, co starring with Michael Rennie in Les Miserables, the famous Victor Hugo classic. We all seem to have a great deal in common. I've directed many pictures at 20th Century Fox, you know. I'd say many outstanding pictures, Irving. And you know, Ty's been making a picture there, too. It's an exciting adventure story called Pony Soldier. Oh, I know all about Ty Power. I met him in Girls' Dormitory. A Girls' Dormitory? Why, Ty, I'm shocked. <laughs> and what were you doing there, Mr. Cummings? Well, Irving was helping my career. I mean, beginning it. You see, I'd given up all hope of a movie career and was going back east. Then I met Irving on the set of a picture he was making, Girls' Dormitory. He gave me the juvenile lead and... And Ty became one of the most popular actors on the screen. 
You see, Deborah, it's just little tricks of fate like that which can make or break a career. Now, Irving, what talent have you lined up for next week? One of the most romantic combinations in motion pictures because they also happen to be husband and wife. I refer, of course, to two of Hollywood's foremost stars, Stuart Granger and Gene Simmons. And they will further the romance by recreating their original roles in that charming love story, Adam and Evelyn, a J. Arthur Rank production released by Universal International Studios. We'll be looking forward to it. Good night. Good night. Good night. And we won't forget you. This is Irving Cummings saying good night to you from Hollywood. Heard in our cast tonight were Michael Pate as Forsyth, Ellen Morgan as Kate, and Herb Butterfield, Gloria Gordon, Leo Britt, Ben Wright, Bill Johnstone, John Dodsworth, Reza Royce, and Eddie Marr. I'll Never Forget You was based on the play Barkley Square by John Balderston. Our play was adapted by S.H. Barnett, and our music was directed by Rudy Schrager. This is your announcer, Ken Carpenter, reminding you to join us again to hear Adam and Evelyn, starring Stuart Granger and Gene Simmons. United States Armed Forces Radio Service.